I want to talk about fivefold, and I'm giving you a month to pray. Aren't I generous? You've got a whole month to seek the Lord because, you know, what I'm saying, you might think, oh, I don't want to be involved in that. I don't want to be a part of that. No, no, no. But I'm giving you a month to hear from God just in case there's any, like, you're not sure. But as I've talked about in the past, the very first person that people come in contact with is an evangelist. They get saved, right? Whether it's in a church meeting or on the street or wherever, but the very first thing is people get saved with an evangelist. Thing is, the evangelist doesn't care what happens to you after you're saved. The minute you've said, I received Jesus into my life, they're going next, and you're on your own. So the way I see Open Heaven Ministries, and and again, we're a prototype. God gave me a prototype when we started, and I've fumbled and stumbled, and I've, I've it's really hard to follow when there's no clear blueprint. But he's given us a, a, photo, a prototype. So the way I see it is that somebody will get saved. So we have some people in here that love to evangelise. Hopefully. Yes. <laughs> but then we need, a, we need a pastoral team. Because those people need to be discipled. Yes. Um, they need to be brought up in the ways of God. They need to be helped to get out of, out of anything from the old. You know, because you're born again, you're a new creation. Old things have passed away. So it's, it's helping them get rid of the old so that they can step into the new. So a pastor nourishes and nurtures and cares and builds them up and um, gets them into that place where they're ready to, to mature in the things of God. The next thing that I see is the prophetic gift coming in. And we have stacks of prophetic gifted people in, the, in open heaven. But a prophetic gifted person would come to... So, say Danielle just got born again. So the evangelist has wiped his hands of her and said, okay, she's good, she's in heaven. And then it comes along to the, the pastor... And the pastor goes, okay, well, I just need to teach you the word of God. I need to teach you how to pray. I need to make sure that you understand the things of God. I'm just going to grow you up in the things of God, disciple you in the ways of Jesus. Perfect. The next thing is that the prophetic, somebody from the prophetic team would come alongside and they would say to my daughter, so to Danielle, say to Danielle this is where I see God taking you this is what I see that that this is either the mountain that he's calling you to work in this is the, the gifts I see in your life this is where I see your life headed and by this time it should resonate with her right because she's been discipled, she can hear from God for herself. So this is confirmation so that's what the prophetic team does and so this is okay so when there's an agreement with that then along comes the teacher and says, what has the prophet said? Or what has the prophetic team said over you? And they would say, oh, that I'm called to the arts and entertainment mountain, creativity, that kind of thing. So the teacher would then say, let me formulate a study for you so that you know what you need to know as you reach that mountain. They need to understand that the spirit that dominates the mountain, uh, what happens in that mountain, let me formulate a study of pattern so that it will prepare you specifically for where God is taking you. The, the teacher teaches them in that, they grow in that, they become established in that, they walk with the apostle for a few months, the apostle feels they're ready, they're commissioned and, and gone, they're released. Come back in six or nine months to make sure that any wounds or anything that have happened, they're healed of, take them to the next level. But that's how I see it working. Does that kind of make sense? So I want you to pray. Two areas. First area, whereabouts are you in the scheme of things? I know that you're all saved. I know that you're mature Christians. Do you know where God is taking you? Have you studied that out in that area? And have you been commissioned? Whereabouts are you? Because you can't move from where you are until you know where you are. So I want you to pray about where you are so that we can can work. And then I want you to pray what part of the team 
or the community of open heaven do you want to work, work in? Do you want to be part of the pastoral team that disciples? Do you want to be part of the prophetic team that directs? Do you want to be part of the teaching team that um, skills you in the word of righteousness for your call? Or do you want to be part of the apostolic team that walks with you and releases you or releases people when they're in the right time? Does that kind of make sense? So there's two areas. Whereabouts are you? And where do you see yourself operating in the fivefold within the house? That's a little bit different to how other people see fivefold ministry. But this is our prototype. Because it's a bit pointless having somebody get saved, they get saved, they've, they've gone through the pastoral bit, they've been cleaned up, and then um, they know they're called to the business mountain, but they are not taught how to handle mammon, Freemasonry, greed and corruption. They're not taught about any of that. They're not taught about arts and entertainment as the spirit of wizardry. They're not taught about any of that. So they go into their call prepared generally, but not prepared specifically. And we want to prepare people specifically for where God positions them. So I've got any questions? Yes. Yes. Just give the pastor, prophetic teacher. Evangelist? No, um, apostle. Think about it like this, the apostle, because he has to be able to do any gift if there's a lack. Um, this finger, oh, let me think. That's the prophetic because it points at you, thus says the Lord. <laughs> this finger that reaches out further than anyone else is evangelistic. This finger that has the ring on it is pastoral. And the one that gets in your ear is the teacher. Gwyn. From a teaching perspective, if we're going to be specific where we want to do, we've also got to have a hole from which we can select material from to be specific to. I've got all that organised. What do you think I've been doing? <laughs> I've got it all organised. I've got basics there for every mountain. I've got the basics of the 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 the, the main spirit that you'll face. Um, there's threshold guardians. We've got that, but you need to know the, the the other side as well. The angels in charge of the mountain. All of that. We've got all of that uh, in, in there. I just need to know what mountain so I can direct people. If we're taking your material, we yeah. Well, it, I should imagine that you would teach it because it would become a part of you. Yeah, but we've got to get through the process. Yeah. <laughs> this is, this is, yeah, he's the teacher, see? <laughs> I'm the apostle. What's the problem? Just do it, right? <laughs> Big gap between the apostle and the teacher. <laughs> but we're working on it. We are working on it. So, but, um, so just, just to tell you that's where I see us going because it's a bit pointless releasing people into destiny if they don't know what they're facing. So any other questions? So two, two things. I'll give you a month to pray about it. I'll come back and ask me questions, anything you like. Gwen. Can we start earlier than a month? Yeah. Well, well, it depends. I just need, people sometimes need time to process. I'm trying to think. I can't. <laughs> you need to process straight away. I have processed straight away. Well, there's a lot of people that haven't and we're moving as a community. <laughs> we're a community. We're one body. <laughs> when am I going overseas again? <laughs> okay. So last week, <laughs> another question? No, no, no. Uh, right. <laughs> so Father, we just come before you and we just ask that you would anoint the word. Oh, because you, you've already anointed the word. He's, the word is Yeshua. The word is Yeshua, the living word of God. So as we come around the word, I pray that we would encounter Yeshua. That you would open our eyes to see wondrous things in your word. That it's not just opening the Bible, but it is, it is having an encounter and an experience with Yeshua himself. So I ask you, Holy Spirit, to prepare us to receive. That you would impart to us what we need imparted. That you would highlight what you want us to follow. We surrender. Come and do in us as you please. In Jesus' name.
I have so carefully written out notes. So, if you want to turn to Matthew chapter 16, because I'm not even going to follow them. Matthew chapter 16. And Gwyn, hopefully next week I'll have PowerPoints. But this is new technology and there's a whole lot of stuff I've got to learn about the new technology, a new program that we're using. So Matthew chapter 16, and we'll start in... Verse 13, Jesus, Yeshua of Jesus went into the region of Caesarea Philippi and asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they answered, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Then Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So right there, he received a revelation from the Father, right? And then in verse 18, he says, And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock... Uh, I will build my church and the gates or the, build the ecclesia and the gates of Hades, the, the gates of hell will not overpower it or hold out against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, the keys of the kingdom, not the keys to the kingdom. You're already in the kingdom. He's given you the keys of the kingdom to open anything you want. And he says, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom and whatever you bind on earth must be what is already bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth must be what is already loosed in heaven. Then he sternly charged and warned the disciples to tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. From that time forth, Jesus began clearly to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders and the high priests and the scribes and be killed, and on the third day be raised from the dead. Then Peter took him aside to speak to him privately and began to reprove the Son of God. He began to reprove Jesus and charge him sharply, saying, God forbid, Lord, this must never happen to you. But Jesus turned away from Peter and said to him, Get behind me, Satan. You are in my way. For you are minding what partakes not of the nature and quality of God, but of men. And then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to be my disciple, let him deny himself, disregard, lose sight of, forget himself and his own interests, and take up his cross and follow me. Cleave steadfastly to me, conform wholly to my example in living and if need be in dying also. So Jesus is saying right there that what came out of Peter's mouth came out of what he was thinking. And he was saying, well, you're thinking not the thoughts of God, but you're thinking the thoughts of man. And this is a stumbling block to me. This could trip me up, Peter. You have, I'm, I'm declaring that it is satanic that's come out of your mouth, and I'm telling you to get behind me. So what I'm saying here is for the ecclesia, and we are the ecclesia, ecclesia, ecclesia. We are it, because Yeshua is using us to build what he wants. And unless we know how it works, we are going to shoot ourselves in the foot. There's going to be sabotage and we're not even going to understand why. Let me tell you, the minute you start to think like a human being, you are thinking like Satan. That's what Yeshua said to Peter, wasn't it? You are not thinking the thoughts of God. You're thinking the thoughts of man. So the thing is, we've become a brand new creation, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. We've been engrafted into Christ. We're in us. He's in us. We're in him. We're in him. He's the, he's the vine. We're the branch. Everything comes out of him. We are so in him, and he is in us. But what he's saying is, you are a brand new creation in Christ, and everything else is passed away. Your old moral Spiritual, mental condition is dead. Let it rest in peace. It's passed away. Challenge is we get born again and we lug this whole lot of stuff with us because we're not aware we've got to renew the mind. We haven't really understood that we've been taken into a new kingdom. You know, the minute you say to, you, you've accepted Jesus into your life, the Father, out of his incredible grace and compassion and loving kindness, reaches into the kingdom of darkness and translates us out of there back into the, son of his, into the kingdom of his son, just like that. The minute you say, Jesus, 
You've been translated out of the kingdom of darkness. Thing is, we keep going back and visit with the way we think. Because you've been made a brand new creation in Christ. All things have passed away. All things have become new. So when I got born again, my, my physical body did not change. But man, my spirit was regenerated and my spirit was made alive and my spirit was connected to God and we were one. Mm. Yes. And my soul was impregnated with everything that was required to cause me to mature in the things of God. It's like when a baby is born, you can't see it, but the baby has the kidneys and the organs, the personality, the, everything within them to cause them to be a successful, m mature adult. We get born again in Christ, translated out of the kingdom of darkness, put into God's kingdom of the son of his love. And everything we need to mature into, into Christ, everything we need to grow, Everything we need, the gifts of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, the attitudes of the Spirit, the love of God, mercy, grace, peace, compassion, justice, kindness, everything is given to us. We've even got the mind of Christ. We've got everything we need. Challenge is we still think we're lacking. We still think we're lacking. And that's the very first sin of Adam and Eve. When the devil came to them, the serpent came or the snake came and said, you know, like, but if you eat this, you're going to be like God. They were hoodwinked mm -hmm. into receiving second best because they were already made in God's image. And the enemy comes and says, oh, but you can be like God. But they're already in his likeness. And so they accepted second best. And from that point on, when they went to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they had to walk past every tree God said they could eat of. You can have anything in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And as they walked to eat of that tree, they had to pass every other tree. And do you know what they saw? Lack. They did not see the abundance that surrounded them. They saw lack. They saw, I need, I have, God's held out on me. I haven't got everything I need to be like him. They were seduced, hijacked into thinking that the second best they are offered was better than what God had given. Right? And so as we become new creations in Christ... As old things have passed away, as old things have become new, as you're made a minister of reconciliation, an ambassador for Christ, and you go through 2 Corinthians 5, 17, down to the end of the chapter, the last verse says that you have been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You cannot be any more righteous because he has made you the righteousness. You cannot be less because God made you the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Now, the righteousness is what God made me. What I do with that is called holiness. I am righteous. Even when I'm, I'm sinning, I'm still righteous. It doesn't affect the degree of righteousness, but it does affect the level of holiness. But all I've got to do is, oh, God, thank you that you've already forgiven my sin. I turn from it. I come back to the cross, I receive your forgiveness, I repent, I thank you for your grace, move on. The challenge is, who do we think like? Are we thinking like Christ? When the doctor's report comes and said, this is what's wrong with you. You've only got so many months to live, or this is what's happening in your body, this is what you need. Do we take that as truth? above the truth of God's word. Because in reality, I called this, I like the title, I don't think anybody else will, but I like the title. I'm of a different race. That's not my case. So the doctor writes a report. Well, I'm of a different race. I'm not a human being anymore. I live in a body, but I'm actually a spirit now. I'm a spiritual being having a human experience. 
Before I was born again, I was a human being living a human experience. But now I'm born again. I am I'm God's race. Aren't we God's race? Yes. We are God's race. We're called sons and daughters of the Most High God. We've been adopted into his family. We've been called heirs of God, joined heirs with Jesus Christ. We've been told that, you know, we're seated with him in heavenly places. We've been a brand new creation like there's never been before on the planet. You're this brand new thing, this race that comes from the heavenly kingdom. You are sons and daughters of the Most High. Oh, my gosh. Seated in heavenly places, far above all principalities and powers far above any name that can be named. Just seated far above. So if I'm far above, they're going to have trouble accessing me. The only way they can access me is if I start to think like a human being on the earth because he was cast down to the earth, wasn't he? This is his turf. So we've got to learn to live in the spirit, by the spirit, of the spirit, from the spirit, But he said in, Ma in Matthew 16, 24, that you've got to give up your life. That those who want to follow me, let me just get it right. I love you, Lord. Matthew 16, 24. If anyone desires to be a disciple, let him deny himself. Let him disregard himself. Let him lose sight of himself. Let him forget himself. Let him lose sight of his own interests. Well, you know, and that basically means that any time I start to think as a human being, I've got to stop that because that's what I want. That's, what, that's, that's the flesh raising up in me. Does this make sense? Yeah. We cannot afford to think like a human being. We are of a different race. We belong to God the Father. He paid for us. Jesus paid the ransom for us. He bought and paid for us. We belong to him. We've been made temples of the Holy Spirit. We belong to him. That makes us a different race. We're still here. I'm living a human body. I have a soul that needs to be renewed and restored. But oh my gosh, if you think I'm a human being, have, you, have I got news for you? Because I am not, baby. When the time comes, I can translate from here to there. When the time comes, I can lay hands on the sick and, and, and heal them. I can raise the dead. We can and speak words of knowledge and words of wisdom into situations and circumstances. We've got influence and significance that is far greater than anything that a human being has. We are amazing, incredible people simply because of Jesus Christ, because of the power of the Holy Spirit, because of the love of the Father, because of the call of God upon our lives. And in the Father's eyes, you are as anointed as Jesus. He loves you as much as, the, as Yeshua. I struggle between Yeshua and Jesus because some churches won't let you say Yeshua. And so you come from places where you said Jesus and I read Jesus in the Bible and then I huh, I will get my act together as the Holy Spirit continues to work on me but it's it's a thing but the thing is you are not who you think you are right I still think of myself as, a, as an earthly mum and I am and there are problems in my family, like in every family, there will always be issues. But if I continue to think as an earthly mother, I am not going to see the redemption, the restoration or the power of God. Yeah. I need to come back into alignment with God's word because any time I start to think contrary to his word, I've come out of agreement with his kingdom and I've gone into agreement with the kingdom of darkness. We cannot afford to think like human beings any longer. And yeah, there are times when you get angry, frustrated, feel totally unfulfilled, rejected, does nobody ever see me? All that kind of thing. That's fine. That's something you work out in your prayer closet and you wait for the Father to respond. It is not something you wear. It is not something you live. You go straight to your prayer closet and you deal with it because you are now a spiritual being. If you can look at all the number of hats that you wear, you're the light of the earth, the salt of, was it the light of the world, the salt of the earth, you're the temple of the Holy Ghost, you're the, um, you're in Christ, with Christ, by Christ, of Christ, with the blood, in the blood, you are um, 
an ambassador for Christ, you're a king, you're a priest, you're a, a son and a daughter of the Most High, you're a member of his royal household. Oh my gosh, all the different hats that you wear. So there's no room in that for human being, humanity. There really isn't. We, we can relate to people because we live in a body, we've been one. But you've got to really start to think of yourself as a brand new creation in Christ. I am a different race. I am a different race. So when the doctor says to me, da-da-da, and they haven't, but when, if a doctor says to me, you know, this is, this is the result of the test, you've got this, that, or something else, well, that's not my case because I'm not of this race. Is anybody getting this? Yes, yes. That's not my case. You might think that that's my case, but that's not true. I am of a different race. I am a supernatural being. The minute I start to think like a human being is the minute I step out of who I am in Christ. So, yeah, there is that opportunity all the time to think like we used to think. And when I was sick, which has been for <laughs> most of this year, there's that opportunity to think, oh, my gosh, you know, I'm over the pain, I'm over this, I'm over that, but I had to keep bringing myself back to the Word of God. And when I was in America, the last trip with Danielle, the only way I could get through the airport, the only way I could move through the conference was to keep my mind on Scripture. God sent his word and healed me and delivered me from the pit and from corruption. Or, you know, my steps are ordered by God. Every breath I take is breathed in by the Holy Ghost. I've been healed by his stripes. The only way I could move around in the States was keeping my mind on scripture. If I stopped, I was a basket case. I couldn't move. Um, the pain was incredible, but it was the scripture that kept me going. And I found out there that I cannot afford the luxury of a single human thought. You are spiritual beings, sons and daughters of the Most High. He has elevated you into a brand new creation, a different race. A different race. Mm. Yep, On the external, nothing changed. Mm -hmm. But everything became God's because Jesus Christ paid the ransom. And we're not trying to get anything. You've already got everything. But what I'm saying is that when we start to think like a human being, when you start to think outside of who you are in Christ, then that's when you open the door and there is a, a breach in the hedge and that you start to, to, to experience humanity in a way that God does not want you to because if we're living in a Goshen, if we are living in a redemptive paradise, then you have got to learn how to think like God thinks. So last week when we talked about Jeremiah and they were taken captive and they went into Babylon, remember? Remember? Yes. And, and God said, well, you might be prisoners of war. You might have been taken captive, but I want you to recognize the, the fathers of the community. I want you to um, build homes. I want you to get married and have children. I want you to plant gardens. I want you to pray for the peace and the prosperity of the city. He's saying you might, in the natural, might be prisoners of war, but you are my covenant people. And this is how you will live in a, in a captivity situation. You will not live as prisoners of war. You will not live as victims. This is how you will live. And so God even then was instructing them on how to think, think differently. You might have been taken captive. You might have been taken as a slave. But I'm telling you that you recognize the fathers in the community and respect the elders. You, you plant gardens. You build your houses. You get married. You have children. You pray for the peace and the prosperity of the city you've been taken to because as it prospers, so will you. These are the plans that I've got for you are good, he says. But they're only good, well, they're always good, but to manifest the goodness, we've got to think the way he wants us to think. So any area of your life where you think that you've got, you know, you're financially this or health-wise that or something where you're not quite, recognize that you've got to come back into alignment with the word of God. You've got to think from the mind of Christ. You are no longer a human being. So the thing is, the thing is, listen, get it right. I am so fed up with, with get it right. Because you are righteous in him. It's not about right and wrong. It is about being righteous. It is not about thinking this, that, or anything else. You are in him. You have everything that you need to be, everything he's called you to be. It is, it is there. It is done. It's a finished work. It's finished. 
it's finished. You don't have to strive. You don't have to struggle. It is finished. It is finished. Now, the interesting thing, when um, Peter, when the, the, the thing is, this has been about covenant and revelation, not the book of revelation, but about a revelation that you get from God so that you can live Goshen, that you can live in that redemptive lifestyle. Peter did not hold the revelation. He lost the revelation for that time, which meant that he couldn't live a redemptive lifestyle, which led that he denied Christ three times. So we've got to catch that thought that comes in immediately. And I'm sorry for getting angry. I'm yelling at such a lot of people lately. I yelled at somebody the other day on Zoom, wake up! <laughs> the more I'm spending time with God, the more... I'm... <sighs> no. <laughs> no. I need to finish, then you can. So back in Matthew chapter 16, where it says, um, uh, you know, Peter's rebuking Jesus. And he, he rebuked him. He said, God forbid you, Lord, this must never happen to you. Do you know what it says in the, what is the, the version of the Bible? Uh, is it Young's? Young's Living. Young's Living. It actually says, Peter says, be kind to yourself, Jesus. Be kind to yourself. This isn't going to happen to you. Be kind to yourself. Not submit yourself to the will of the Father. Not be obedient. Just be kind to yourself. And how often do we use that? I've had a tough day. I'm just going to veg out in front of the telly. I've had to be so nice to people. I need to shove my mouth full of something or other so I don't say something I shouldn't. But isn't it be kind to yourself? And that's something that we really need to look about because Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, you have to deny yourself. Now, if we're in the rest of Christ, he will lead us into his kindness for us. But the kindness that we want to inflict on ourselves is, is usually out of the flesh. So Peter had this amazing revelation. He's walking in covenant with God. He has this amazing revelation that Yeshua is the Son of God. But then when something that makes him uncomfortable, insecure, uncertain, yeah. doubting, comes in, he grabs Jesus and says, this, isn't gonna, this is not the way it's going to be. And sometimes we do that with the word of God. We take hold of a promise because that promise looks good to us instead of waiting for a revelation that will change everything. And because he didn't hold that revelation of who Christ was, because he humanized the whole situation, he could no longer live that redemptive lifestyle. And that led him to denying Christ three times. It led him to Jesus saying, you know, Satan, <laughs> Peter, beware. Satan's after sift you like wheat. But I've prayed for you. And when you turn, strengthen your brothers. When you get a revelation, you walk in covenant, which means you deny yourself. Those thoughts that come. I had a day the other day where I said to Danny, two bags of potato crisps. I did not deny myself. But we need to walk, recognize that we live in covenant, which means not my will, but your will be done. Come on. I delight to do your will, God. Yes. I'm prepared to lose sight of my own interests, my own desires, my own things, in order to walk in the fullness of Jesus. Yeah. I just want to please you, Father. I want to live to execute your pleasure. So Peter was walking in a covenant received an amazing revelation, but lost it. When you get a revelation, that holds a key to victory for your future. And you are to keep that revelation. Allow the Holy Spirit to store it in your heart and in your soul. Meditate upon it. Study it out. Allow it to become word in your flesh. so that you truly live Christ the Messiah. 
What the world is looking for is Christ. And we are little Christs. But sometimes we don't, ex we don't manifest him the way we should. So every part of us, body, soul and spirit, was redeemed. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23 is a brilliant prayer for the redemption of, of spirit, soul and body and that it would be cleansed of anything that is perverted. If you turn to, and we'll finish with this, and I probably touched on it last week, but turn to Mark 7. I don't know. I wasn't here last week. I was in Perth. Yeah. <sighs> Mark chapter 7, verse 15. And it goes down to, I think, around about verse 23. But five times in those scriptures, the word defile is used. The things that come out of a man, that defile a man. The thoughts that come out, the actions that come out from the thoughts, that's what defiles. Do you know there are 16 different types of defilement in the word of God? 16 different types of defilement. One of them is a weeping wound. But this, this word in this, these scriptures actually means common. It says, um, verse 15, There is not one thing outside a man which by going into him can pollute and defile him, but the things which come out of a man, that's what's on the inside in our unrenewed soul from the works of the flesh, are what defile him and make him unhallowed and unclean. That word defile actually means common. And what it means is you are acting like a normal human being. Wow. So anytime we allow ourselves or give ourselves permission to act like a normal human being, we have defiled ourselves. This is a heavy word. But as an ecclesia, you cannot allow the luxury of a single negative or human thought. And if you think it, close it down real quick. Just thank you, God, that's not who I am. I'm of a different race. And I thank you, God, that your word says, come straight back into alignment with him. God's grace, it's not about works. It's not about you trying to do it or striving to do it. It's about the grace of God and the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit on the inside of us. Because Paul said in Galatians chapter 4, verse 19, I, I travail until Christ is fully formed in you. So it's a process. It's not something that automatically happens. I don't automatically get my thoughts right. You know, I have to renew my mind, like it says in Romans 12. But it's, we don't, it doesn't start in Romans 12, verse 2. It starts in Romans 12, verse 1, where it says, By the mercies of God, you know, I urge you to, to make yourself a living sacrifice. Because when you're a living sacrifice, then you're not conformed to the world. Because then you can renew your mind to the things of God. And so you can prove the perfect good and the other thing of, of the acceptable will of God. So it's recognising these things, right? That first of all, we've got to be that living sacrifice. I cannot be a living sacrifice. Chuck me on the altar, I'll crawl off. Fire's too hot, I'll find a way to get an extinguisher. You know, in myself and of myself, I don't always work with God. That's the flesh that rises up. That says, and, and it says in Romans chapter 8, verse 7, I think, that the, the, the mind that is set on the flesh is an enemy to God. That's why Jesus said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. And he wasn't talking to the man. He was talking to the spirit that was working through him. You are loved of God. You have been redeemed. You are ransomed. You're with Christ, in Christ, by Christ, through Christ, all of those amazing things. But as an ecclesia, if you want to take your place in the heavenlies, we have to come to the place where we recognise who we are. I'm of a different race. I might look like a human being, but I am a divine alien. I'm a spiritual alien, whatever you want to call it, but I am God's race. I, am the, I, I belong to God the Father. I am part of his kingdom, part of his family, part of his race. And I am here 
for the good of people, to bring them to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, to heal them, deliver them, set them free. I'm here for the good of people, to set them free and to establish his kingdom. That's why I cannot afford to think like them. Because the minute I think like them, I flow with them. And I don't want to flow with them. I want to flow with the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yes. So it's very much recognising that you actually have not just a new identity, but you are a new race of people. Mm. And I have a heavenly visa to live in Australia. Yeah. I might have been born here. You might have been brought here. But it was by the will of God. And my first and foremost, my allegiance is to God's government, to God's kingdom, and to the fact that he sent me here for his purpose. Yes, yes. And this is a serious word, and I haven't meant it to be a heavy word, and this is just the beginning. This is going to be a five-part series. So there's, there's stuff that you know, Leah and, and Cambria have brought up we'll be looking at down the track. But I wanted to set the, the, the bottom line is that you are no longer a human being. You are a spiritual being having a human experience. Every part of you, spirit, soul and body, has been redeemed. You belong to him. Jesus is your kinsman redeemer. He is everything. He paid the ransom for you. But it's our mind is the battlefield. And when I think like a human being, I defile myself. I come into agreement and um, with the, the, the spirit of this world, this age. And it's nothing you can do by works. It is allowing the Holy Spirit to bring the, you know, the Holy Spirit to say, hey, think in the wrong thought. Oh, not a problem, I'll change. The Holy Spirit does it. The grace of God empowers you to fulfill it. The word of God is your course correction, your compass. Yeah. It's not about works, but it is about yielding totally to the way the Father sees you, how he wants to mould you because you're the, you're the clay. Mm. He's the potter. And what he wants to do with you and where he wants to take you. But the stumbling stone is not Yeshua in this one. The thing that's a trap, the thing that will cause you to fall, the thing that will open up a breach for you is when we start to think like the world. Mm. And so it's recognising. Like, and I was told this story before and I, it was in a Kenneth Copeland magazine and it was years ago but it has stayed with me as, a, as an example of this, that this man was told by God that this particular job was his. He was looking for work, had been praying about it. There is an ad in the paper and the Lord said to him, that's the position I have for you. So he went for it. He, was, he made the short list, but then he got a letter. This is how long ago it was. He got a letter saying, you didn't make it. So he got a big red pen and wrote across that letter, unacceptable and sent it back to the company <laughs> unacceptable so they then got in touch with him because they'd never received a letter like that before <laughs> brought him in for another interview and he got the job yeah, he was so you got, you got to recognize what the Lord has told you hold on to the revelation yeah. Yeah. Peter did not hold on to it mm. hold on to your revelation because we are going to be living a redemptive lifestyle, which means that you are elevated above the ways of this world, the Babylonian system. You are elevated above sickness and disease and death. You are elevated above poverty, worry, anxiety, loneliness and toxic relationships. You are actually going to be living like Christ because you are conformed to his image. You're growing into the fullness and the stature of Christ. He is being fully formed in us. And so we recognise that if we think like a mere mortal, 
we are allowing a demonic influence or whatever to trip us up and to stop us. Colossians, let me finish with this. And, and like I said, this is a five-part series. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. If then you have been raised. Well, who has been raised? Is it an if or is it a definite? It's a, de it's a definite. We have been raised, right? Since. Since. I like that much better. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Aim at and seek the rich eternal treasures that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. So set your mind and keep it set on what is above, on the higher things, not on the things that are on the earth. For as far as this world is concerned, you have died. And your new real life is hidden with Christ in God. So that, that thing, as far as this world is concerned, you've died. Every now and again, I realise I have not died to the world. Am I the only one who has not completely died to the world? <laughs> Every now and again, my flesh goes, you know, oh, that'd be a bit of fun. Why don't we do that? Let's watch a bit of telly. Let's binge out. Let's just forget about everything. Let's just bury our head under the doona with a good book and some food, whatever it might be. But I have got to be dead to this world. Now, I can't do that. It's the revelation that I was crucified with Christ. It's the revelation that I was crucified with Christ. And it's no longer I who live, but he lives in me. And I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is the whole thing. When we get that revelation, you're not going to think like a human being. You're not going to react like a human being. You're not going to speak like a human being. Because we're being conformed to the image of Christ. Christ.